Um, so welcome to uh, this uh, second session of the afternoon. Um, uh, so our topics here are, are, are diverse um, on um, various um, IoT use cases. Um, and I believe we'll, we'll hear about exciting things. Um, <clears throat> so our first uh, talk today is uh, from Christel Gaba. Um, who uh, received her PhD from the University of Caen in 2013. Um, and she works for Orange as a research en engineer um, on several projects related to uh, cyber physical security, uh, AOT device management and certification of uh, integrated SIMs and the accreditation of SIM production sites. And um, now uh, the floor is, is yours, Christel. So you're going to talk about the software defined IoT. If I'm not mistaken. Um, so please, uh, the, the floor is yours. Okay, so I started sharing my screen. I think you can see it, if you can confirm. Perfectly. Okay, so as uh, Emmanuel introduced me, uh, I am uh, Crystal Gaber. Um, I am a research engineer at Orange. I work on multiple subjects on uh, security uh, and in particular on uh, IoT uh, and now a little bit more on 5G. Uh, so today I will talk about software def uh, defined IoT, uh, its next steps and, uh, and some challenges. Uh, if it's going to the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, soft defined IoT, uh, it's at the crosswords of uh, three different trends today in uh, in computing. Uh, first of all, sharing of physical infrastructure, uh, which uh, corresponds that uh, to the fact uh, that a physical infrastructure is simultaneously um, supporting multiple applications. Uh, and which uh, are belonging to multiple parties. So qu cloud computing is the best uh, is the best example of um, of such an approach of sharing infrastructure. And today there is also the same trend for uh, sharing um, network infrastructure. So we start to share uh, towers um, and some antennas with some other operators. Uh, and uh, we also envision that uh, that in the future, uh, IoT infrastructure will also be shared. Uh, so this is uh, what the IoT is all about. Um, there is also the rise of a trend, which is a software-defined architecture. So here, the best example, it's a software-defined networks, which allow, uh, which enables flexible network control by separating the data plane and the control plane. So uh, this is because there are growing uh, complexity of infrastructure in the era of IoT, and we think it will be necessary to borrow the insight of a software-defined network uh, to realize flexible control and a management of IoT infrastructure. And finally, there is also a big trend of uh, using um, application programming interfaces, so APIs, to uh, to describe uh, a physical infrastructure and hide the complexity and heterogeneity of uh, of it. Uh, so, for example, we already see that there is LWL M2M that defines a model of uh, IoT resources, and you can query these uh, these resources with uh, with this protocol. Uh, so, I'm trying to go to the next slide, but there is some latency. Uh, so. Why do we need, why do I think we need uh, SDIoT? Um, Internet of Things is a paradigm which aims to connect uh, min multiple millions of connected devices around the world. And uh, large data are uh, are going to be produced with uh, in this scope. To, com to cope with such an increase of, um, of data, uh, network infrastructure will need to evolve uh, and um, we'll need to, to uh, install new network and core devices. However, this is need to do that in an efficient way to guarantee quality of service, but also to optimize costs. And finally, finally, with IoT, um, many sensitive services like Industry 4.0, 
uh, e-health or automotives show that uh, these domains um, there's they have some uh, safety requirements which are likely to have an impact on uh, the security requirements uh, of a network infrastructure infrastructure and in order to take all these aspects into account uh, we think that virtualization and orchestration can be seen as potential solutions so if you research uh, SDIoT on the internet, you will find the three main architectures that are mentioned in this slide. So first of all, um, software defined networks is a way to separate the control and the data plane of network devices. So in traditional architectures, the controller is actually part of the router architecture and in instructs switches where to forward the packets. Uh, in software-defined networks, the routers are programmed and they are controlled by a central entity, the controller, which allows the network to provide uh, cost-effective and adaptable traffic uh, and quality of service for data transmission. Uh, network function virtualization, on the other side, it goes further uh, because it decorrelates network functions such as uh, firewall, intrusion detection systems, and, uh, and it also hides the physical features of the network devices. So on one side, you have the network function infrastructure, uh, which is composed by the physical devices, and on the other side, you have the um, uh, virtual network functions that you need to uh, to migrate and to uh, um, to uh, put in the network and depending on the needs so nfv is actually often combined with uh, with sdn uh, it allows to reprogram um, switches um, and also provide on demand uh, in, in the functions in, in the network uh, it can be be used to adapt to new situation in uh, the IoT ecosystem. So, for example, if there is a DDoS attack uh, coming from multiple uh, IoT devices, if this attack is dis detected, well, you can deploy a filtering virtual function uh, at the edge of the network, and you can block uh, all the traffic that is coming uh, from uh, these IoT devices. So this is the principle of, uh, of NFV uh, combined with SDN. So finally, in the IoT, uh, you also virtualize the sensor control panel. So uh, this allows to have more elaborate and uh, specific solutions for IoT. So for example, uh, the controller, it's not only able to uh, reprogram the network to deploy uh, and configure some intrusion detection a virtual uh, function, it's also able to uh, update IoT devices um, based, on, um, based on the needs and to, uh, to adapt, uh, for example, uh, to a security threat. Next slide. Um, so SD-IoT is combined of uh, three layers. First of all, the physical layer, which is composed of uh, various kinds of physical devices, such as the sensor platforms, the network devices, like some uh, gateways, some base stations, uh, switches or routers, but also source some service servers if you need some uh, cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, however, these uh, devices in the physical infrastructure, they do not determine what, uh, what to do by themselves. They leave the decision making to the control layer um, and they interact with it with uh, several standard interfaces and in this slide they are named the southbound interface. Uh, the controller layer, it acts as an intermediary between the infrastructure layer and the application layer. It manages the devices uh, and it provides services through APIs to the application layer. So in SDIoT, uh, generally this layer provides some uh, services like uh, data acquisition, uh, data transmission and data processing. And finally, in the application layer, that's where uh, developers can build some added value servicing services, sorry, uh, using the APIs that are provided by the control layer. So uh, here we can see that um, without uh, caring much about uh, what is the um, physical infrastructure, what is the processor, uh, what is the configuration of the physical device, 
the developer will be able to customize the uh, acquisition, transmission, or processing, um, which makes their lives easier. Uh, we, it means that uh, we probably need uh, some people who don't know uh, many platforms, um, but, and so it reduces the development and maintenance costs. Um, here is a uh, more inside the, the infrastructure, but still a high level view. Uh, in SD IoT architecture, the, there is an um, application management layer that it pilots actually the control layer. So it's in it uh, exchanges uh, some APIs, but it can also exchange some SLA service level agreements and some security policies that are, are defined by, um, by the application administrators or developers. The orchestrator uh, needs to take some decision. Uh, it will take some decision, for example, concerning the placement of virtual network function uh, or some countermeasures uh, and ma managing the IoT. So for example, it can either be to deploy a virtual network function uh, to address some need or maybe to restart an IoT to install an update, uh, things like that. Um, and so the orchestrator will need to find the optimal solutions which will satisfy the committed SLA, the security policy, uh, and also it will need to adapt to the events and actions uh, that are coming from the network infrastructure and the IoT devices. Once these decisions are taken, it's actually up to the network function virtualization manager and orchestrator that we called that we call NFV Mano, and to the IoT controller to actually implement them either on the network or on the IoT devices. So to summarize the possibilities with SD IoT to, is to configure the network. Uh, to deploy some uh, VNF for on-demand uh, quality of service, security, or storage services to manage IoT devices. So, for example, to do updates, restart it, uh, and also to share and manage access to IoT device. So, uh, you can put in place some uh, access control. So, I want to, I will show two use cases. Uh, the first one I called it uh, Serenity at Home. Uh, so we see that uh, in, uh, in 2019, uh, the Japanese National Institute of uh, Information and Communications Technology, the NICT, announced that it would start scanning the internet for insecure IoT devices and test commonly default uh, credentials. So their objective was to find weekly secured IoT devices and to notify their users and provide them basic information on ways to secure their device. Um, I think that it would be possible for service providers to take such a responsibility and to provide some, uh, some offers that could help some um, uh, private IoT uh, owners to, to have a secure, a secure IoT devices. Um, and I think this kind of service can develop in the in the coming years. Um, and so, for example, this uh, assistance service provider can isolate the IoT devices in specific subnetworks if he finds that uh, there is uh, some uh, malicious uh, behavior or um, if uh, this uh, be um, this device is uh, um, working on some sensitive data that need to be segregated from the rest of the network. Uh, it can ensure that security updates and, and patches are applied. And also it could enrich the security capacities with the security services placed uh, at the edge of the network or in the fog, that means in, inside the, the house. So for example, we could imagine that uh, the live box, uh, in the live box, we can deploy a VNF uh, where, we uh, implement some countermeasures, so for example, some filtering. Um, a second use case is actually for 5G infrastructure manager. So here I put uh, the image of, uh, uh, it was an article uh, from Orange last year that uh, the operators is st are starting to deploy some IoT devices to monitor 5G antennas. And right now these uh, IoT, they are uh, controlled um, 
by dedicated tools. But I think it would be interesting to uh, add these dedicating tools in the 5G infrastructure management. And so um, to have the visibility of the whole 5G infrastructure and not only network infrastructure. So for example, uh, imagine this case, the operators start deploying these IoT devices um, and if uh, they are not correctly separated in the network, well, the IoT could be used as a pivot entry point to, to attack the antenna. Uh, or alternatively, uh, more, more simple attack, maybe it could be that um, an attacker takes control of several IoT devices on one or more antenna, and they could simulate issues on poles uh, and mobilize some resources because the, maybe the operator will think that uh, the antennas are broken, they will send some uh, some people to repair them, uh, and this could um, take uh, some resources that are needed elsewhere and also cost a lot of money. Um, so I think that sharing the control panel of these sensing devices with the control panel of virtual infra functions uh, for 5G infrastructure will make it possible to verify the trustworthiness of the sensed data and also have a multifaceted visibility uh, of the security in uh, the 5G infrastructure. But uh, there are still some uh, road ahead and so for example I think that um, something that can evolve is actually to have IoT function virtualization um, today we saw that uh, SDN um, really uh, started to, to, to be deployed when uh, NFV uh, was, uh, came into the picture. And so I think that also having some virtualization of a sensing function could, be, uh, could help uh, the IoT. So what I mean by that is instead of updating IoT firmware over the air, we could uh, update only some application logic on the IoT uh, using some scripts. And so I will develop this ID later on. So today, if I talk about reprogrammability of IoT devices, there are actually two, two approaches that have been proposed in the literature, or at least uh, to my knowledge. Uh, the, first, um, the first approach is, uh, is to have a virtual uh, data plane. So here in the image, uh, you can see uh, an example of a virtual sensor. And actually, this uh, virtual sensor is giving some image of, uh, of the data um, that is really created by the sensors. But um, it, it's replicating the data and only exposing this replicated uh, data. And well, the second proposal, actually, it uh, it relies on a, a convergence of cloud and IoT. So um, there are more and more sensors, there are more and more devices. Um, there, so the complexity of the architecture uh, is growing and the quantity of generated data is also uh, escalating. And it makes it difficult right now uh, for conventional data centers in, in the cloud to provide uh, services. So while respecting, for example, requirements on uh, latency or uh, privacy. So um, today, most cloud infrastructures scale horizontally across uh, multiple nodes in a data center. But to manage this large quantity of data, latency or privacy concerns, uh, it, it's, it would be necessary for them to also scale vertically from the data center's node to low-end processors uh, at the closest of the data sources. So such nodes, call, we call them FOG nodes, uh, they, cover all, they cover overall uh, any device with uh, computing, so uh, with uh, storage and network connectivity. So it can be industrial controls, video cameras, or also smart light. Um, this is a decentralized approach that could also be complemented with a paradigm function as a service where um, you only execute a function when it is needed um, based on some, uh, some events. Um, and so to achieve this vision, uh, it would be necessary to have some uh, virtualization or some uh, container-like solution for low-end devices. 
Um, and actually, there has been some work done on Riot that, uh, that goes in this way. Uh, it's an article from, uh, from Emmanuel Bacelli uh, to create some uh, scripting containers that can be updated remotely. So, um, and I think that for IoT, the benefits actually go beyond the management of uh, large quantities of data. It's, uh, it could also avoid to have some uh, big programs where all uh, conditions are predefined and to have some complicated if then else sequences. We could up update application logic without having to reboot. Um, or to load some uh, privacy uh, uh, mechanisms uh, on the device to, to collect the data uh, and to treat the data before sending them. Um, and so here in this image, we I am showing how uh, we could make evolve the network function virtualization architecture uh, to include some sensing fu functions. Um, and so you can see several devices, a cloud con continuum from the cloud from to the devices, uh, and also some um, boxes for uh, for sensing function. So uh, as a conclusion in this talk, first I introduced the reasons why SD IoT is gaining a momentum, uh, and I prevent present a high-level view of an SD IoT architecture. Um, and I highlighted the need for virtualization uh, for, um, for low-end devices. Um, and finally, oops, and I think I missed actually the challenges. Oh, there was a, an issue in my slide. Um, Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm really sorry. I see that there, there was a slide missing with uh, the challenges. Uh, so we'll just uh, tell them uh, now. So um, the challenge is really to create this, uh, this uh, virtualization uh, for low-end devices because uh, there is um, the, uh, there are constraint devices uh, and to create such a technology is, uh, is going to be hard. It, uh, mostly if you have to um, guarantee some uh, isolation and security uh, properties. And this is going to be challenges, challenging given the place. Um, and also there is a challenge for the um, cont uh, controller, the orchestrator, because right now the orchestrators, they are managing VNFs. They are not managing IoT, so there is a question of compatibility. Can we take a decision for VNF and also for IoT? Uh, and finally, there is a question related to liability management, because uh, all these architectures I'm talking about, um, they are complex and they, uh, they make intervene different actors uh, which have different scope. Um, and have different objectives. And so we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that the liabilities or the responsibilities of each of them are clear and are clearly shared. Uh, most of all, because also uh, IoT is uh, linked to safety challenges. Um, and so these were the three challenges that were supposed to be uh, on the slide that, that I missed. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you for, for listening to me and um, don't hesitate to contact me if you have some any questions and I will let you ask uh, your questions <laughs> right now. Thank you, Christelle. So a uh, big clap uh, uh, for Thanks. me and from all others I, uh, that we see in the chat. Um, um, so there are already uh, some reactions and some questions. Um, so um, Hannes um, was asking, um, like when the M2M, uh, um, do you want do you want to talk, Hannes, or should I uh, should I just read your question? Uh, I, yeah, I can ask uh, myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, looking at this SDIoT um, functionality that you were talking about in your slides, I was wondering um, whether you had a chance to look at the, the lightweight M2M protocol because it. Uh, could allow you to do some of the things that you've been describing, including the software, pushing the software updates and also uh, this um, 
changing configuration settings, changing sort of like networking characteristics for 5G and other, net other networks? Yes, uh, so I had the opportunity to look at it. And actually, I, I think that such a protocol is uh, would be uh, an essential uh, in uh, in SDIoT. Uh, and I think I moved too far because um, uh, if I go back, the LWM2M protocol, typically this is where, what would be used between the IoT and the IoT controller uh, here uh, on this slide. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So, so cool. typically uh, for me, this is uh, this is where this protocol could come in the picture. Uh, for for me, what I wanted to highlight in SD IoT that uh, the IoT controller here it's not the only one taking the decision. The decision is taken by the orchestrator, which has a full view actually of the network. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, if uh, if it decides that uh, some uh, some de IoT device has uh, a weird behavior and it should be rebooted, there there will be some kind of high level uh, decision at the orchestrator to say that uh, this device should be uh, should be rebooted. It will pass this decision to the IoT controller, and the IoT controller will effectively take this uh, will effectively implement this. Uh, and potentially using uh, LWM to M. Cool. Thanks. Are there other questions or reactions? If if not, I have a I have a question uh, for you, Christelle. So um, you uh, you're mentioning some some safety aspects um, and. Uh, and some 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 security aspects to um, to these um, to this um, uh, um, to this kind of systems. And uh, as as you have a background in certification, uh, once you uh, start to put uh, in the mix uh, uh, software updates over the air, uh, how how does this affect the potential certification uh, processes uh, or even you know, what you can certify in the end, uh, what you should aim to certify in the end. Uh, sorry? Oh, okay, that's someone else. Um, so here, this is a, a complex infrastructure uh, where you would need to certify many things. Um, uh, for IoT, I right now, I think uh, it will need to, to compose uh, certifications. Uh, because you see that there are some um, different um, uh, tools which have different objectives, and so you will need to to compose these uh, certification. Uh, right now in IoT, uh, there are some works I think by Enisa to define a certification scheme for IoT, um, and uh, I think in that aspect, each uh, each firmware update should. Uh, um, should go through its own uh, certification, um, but they should be independent from, for example, of uh, to the certification of, v of VNF or NFV infrastructure. But then, if we're talking just about IoT, uh, I think if there are some uh, major changes, it should go through a new certification uh, process. Or if the changes are minor, actually, I know that there are some um, maintenance uh, certification. But this is up to the certification body actually to to decide if this is a major change, uh, not that major change, and so to to adapt the the process. Uh, I don't know if this uh, answers your question. Yes. Um, maybe also a note that uh, Enisa right now they're discussing about three levels of certification for for IoT. So there is kind of a baseline certification. Um, for, my uh, recent uh, information, but maybe not that recent, uh, was that this baseline certification, it would be some kind of self-assessment. So the manufacturer would need to fill in a form uh, and um, declare some uh, some behavior uh, of the IoT device. And there, there is um, a substantial level and critical level. Uh, well, substantial level, it's uh, if the IoT device uh, uh, manages some data that is more sensitive uh, and in this case it uh, it can go through a certification with a third party 
And when it's critical, actually, it means um, it, it means uh, um, that there will be certification by a third party, but also additional controls. Um, that's, I think, the status of the of the discussion with Eniza. But the perimeter of each level of control is not yet fully defined, at least to my knowledge. Thanks for this uh, detailed answer. Um, there are a couple of other questions that um, uh, popped up in the in the chat. Um, so Frank was asking if you're using Riot in your 5G antenna monitoring and um, what kind of OSs are you consider did you consider for this application and in, in, in if, if not Riot? So uh, to be honest, right now on my side, I am not involved in the five antennas and the IoT deployment on, on antennas. Uh, on my side, I am a research engineer, so I am working on uh, future solutions. Uh, and one of the things that we're considering is that we are interested to have some uh, some kind of a cloud uh, edge IoT continuum. And in this is the place where we are interested to work with uh, Riot. Uh, actually, uh, I read uh, last year the article from uh, Emmanuel on uh, scripting over the air, uh, and I found it very interesting. And this is uh, this is some start for some uh, common works. Uh, we we post we responded to a project um, request, but uh, but we did not have the the answer yet to to work on this. And there was another question uh, by Angel, um, but it's a little bit unclear to me. It, it reads like, what about the devices for SDIoT? So, uh, Angel, Angel, do you want to uh, uh, precise your answer uh, by um, talking in, uh, in your microphone or? Angel? No? Okay. Um, Apparently he cannot speak, so oh, maybe. maybe he was asking like what type of devices is what I would infer from his question, like what type of devices when in this slide that you currently have, for example, like uh, can you characterize maybe a little bit more uh, what kind of devices is this IoT uh, um, box that you have there? Uh, Actually, it can be any kind of IoT device as long as it can be controlled uh, by a, a, an external uh, part. So, for example, an IoT device which uh, supports LWM2M is uh, um, is fully supported because uh, you can uh, uh, the LWM2M protocol. There is an agent and there is a, a sort of a master. So that would be the IoT controller. Uh, but uh, actually, you could also imagine that a legacy device IoT device which can be managed with uh, uh, proprietary protocol. Uh, could also be included for if uh, this pr proprietary protocol, uh, there is uh, some kind of API uh, that allows to, to control this, uh, this device. So I, I would say to enter this architecture that I'm displaying right now, the, the IoT must display some kind of API to, to make it controllable for, from uh, the outside. Thanks. Um... One uh, question from the chat, um, and then maybe we'll move on to the next uh, uh, talk. Um, so Michel uh, asks, like, does STIoT consider approaches to estimate or guarantee data quality of uh, aggregated sensor reading, for example? So that could be uh, that could be uh, one of the applications. So um, the the idea of this architecture is um, is well, it could be to guarantee some quality of service. So quality of service, it means uh, some uh, indicators regarding performance. Uh, so uh, performance of data transmission, it could be also performance of, uh, aqu um, of data that, he, um, that is collected. Uh, since the orchestrator could have um, a view of the application uh, of the data in, that are collected by the IoT. This orchestrator is not only having a, a view on the um, IP headers, it also has the view of inside of the network packets. It has the capacity to reason uh, inside the, the pack, uh, on the um, application part of the network packet. So it's able to, to do some reasoning 
um, that is that goes beyond uh, just a filtering an IP address or a port. Uh, it can do uh, many things. Um, don't know if this is a clear answer. Apparently, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Just appeared in the chat. <laughs> Okay, um, then um, I propose we thank uh, Christelle for a nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, and um, we, for people who have like um, uh, further questions, uh, maybe uh, in this, uh, maybe in Gather Town afterwards.